Hello, I'm Don Mockholtz, and you are listening to Looking Up with Don. This is the Looking Up with Don podcast, episode number 76, for the week of June 16th, 2021. The related website for this podcast is donmacholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z.com. Two H's. What's up in the sky this week? As our week begins on Wednesday, June 16th, the moon is 30% full in our evening sky. By the end of the week, Tuesday, June 22nd, the moon will be nearly full and up for the whole night. Full moon is on Thursday, June 24th. The planet Venus dominates the western sky, setting about 90 minutes after the sun. Over the next few months, it will get brighter as it moves farther from the sun as seen from the Earth. The planet Mars passes through the Beehive Cluster, M44, on Wednesday, June 23rd and Thursday, June 24th. Mars is magnitude 1.8, slightly brighter than the North Star. This would look great in binoculars or a telescope. This is also an excellent photo opportunity. Shortly after Venus sets, Saturn rises in the east. This is followed an hour later by Jupiter. We have a new nova in our evening sky. A nova is a new star. Not really new, it is a previously faint star that exploded or in some way greatly increased in brightness. It is known as the Nova in Hercules. It is technically in the constellation Hercules, but it's further south of that uh, portion of the constellation, and it's near Aquila. It was discovered on June 12th by C.G. Unid of Japan at 8th magnitude. The next night it brightened to 6th magnitude. Since then it has dimmed to magnitude 7. It is plotted on Podcast 76, Map 3. Summer officially begins in the Northern Hemisphere this Sunday, June 20th at 1532 Universal Time. At that time, the sun reaches its point furthest north and slowly begins to move southward. For those in the Northern Hemisphere, north of 23 degrees north, near noon, the sun will cast its shortest shadow of the year. If you live at 23 degrees north, the sun will be exactly overhead at about noon. And if you live between 23 degrees south and 23 degrees north, the sun is overhead a couple of times each year, once when it heads north and again when it heads south. The dates depend upon your latitude. The sun also reaches six hours right ascension on June 20th. Objects at 18 hours right ascension will be high in your sky at midnight. For the southern hemisphere, June 20th is the first day of winter. Will you be able to see the International Space Station this week, which for our purposes begins Wednesday, June 16th through Tuesday, June 22nd? This week we have four zones. All you need to know is your latitude. North of 35 degrees north, you won't see the ISS at all this week. Canada, Russia, England, Sweden, take a break. Between 5 degrees south and 35 degrees north, the International Space Station is in your morning sky for at least part of the week. Between 20 and 5 degrees south, the ISS will be in both your morning and evening skies for at least part of the week. South of 20 degrees south, the ISS will be in your evening sky for at least part of the week. Australia, South Africa, that is you, evening sky. To determine where it will be in your sky, go to the website heavens-above.com 
and enter your location, then click on ISS. You can also find at heavens-above.com the location of almost any satellite and many comets and asteroids. Periodic Comet 7P Pons Winnicky is still in our morning southern sky. Now it's about 15 degrees south of Jupiter. It's presently at magnitude 11. Comet 7P Pons Winnicky is plotted on Podcast 76, Map 4. Its positions, that is right ascension and declination, are on Podcast 74, Comet Positions. You can also go to the website heavens-above.com and click on Comets. Now for the astral class, the eye. Your eyes, my eyes. Our eyes make astronomy possible. The eye and the brain work together to help us to see. Buckle in for this one. We discuss a lot of stuff. Look in the mirror at your eye. Smile, this will not hurt. The white part is called the cornea. The colored part is the iris, and the dark part in the center is the pupil. That is where light enters. Behind the pupil is a lens, and that focuses the light. You can't see it, but the inside back of your eyeball is where the image is formed. This is called the retina. It is spelled R-E-T-I-N-A, which seems to me to be pronounced retina, but it is actually retina. There are sensors on that area. The two types of sensors are rods and cones. Two other things to know about the retina. The cones are concentrated in an area known as the fovea. Secondly, the area where the optical nerve leaves the eye and goes to the brain causes a small blind spot. The eyeball is filled with a liquid called vitreous humor. Okay, that is the anatomy of the eye. How does all of this relate to astronomy? The pupil is where the light comes in, like a diaphragm in a camera, It can increase and decrease in size, depending mainly upon the amount of light that is entering it. In bright conditions, the pupil constricts. It gets smaller, so less light enters the eye. When the light level is low, the pupil dilates. That is, it gets larger, so more light will enter the eye. A couple of things I learned in the 1980s when I learned how to fit contact lenses on patients and used what is known as a slit lamp to look into people's eyes. Number one, the pupil size can be different for each eye. And two, as the heart beats, the pupil changes slightly in size with each heartbeat. I could, if I wanted, determine someone's heart rate by watching their pupils expand and contract. So when you go out at night and look at the stars, the pupils get bigger to let in more light. How big? We measure in millimeters. They say that the average for young people is about 8 millimeters in diameter. That's a third of an inch. As a person ages, the maximum pupil size generally decreases. Now why is this important? Optical instruments such as binoculars and telescopes, gather light in the front end, then pushes it out the back end as a small beam. If that beam is larger than your pupil, then some of the light from the instrument misses your pupil, falling on the iris instead, and you won't get the advantage of the full aperture of the instrument. A 10-inch telescope might act as an 8-inch telescope, for instance. How does one measure the pupil size of their eye? I've done this frequently with a millimeter ruler. I would stand in the bathroom, turn on the light, and look into the mirror. I would then line up the ruler in front of my eye. I then turned off the light so only dim ambient light would strike my eye, often from the side. 
I would have the bathroom door open only enough to let in light to see my pupil in the ruler. My pupil would expand as soon as I turned off the light. I then measured it with the millimeter ruler, counting off the millimeter marks on the ruler. You can have your eye doctor do this, but be sure to have them do this before they put the eye drops into your eyes, which expand the pupils. Okay then, how do you determine the size of the beam of light coming out of your binoculars or telescope? This is called the exit pupil. For binoculars, which we'll discuss in more detail next week, take the two numbers, such as 7 by 50 or 7 by 35, perhaps 10 by 50 or 11 by 80. Those numbers are usually marked on the faceplate of the binoculars. To get the exit pupil in millimeters, divide the small number into the big number. Let's do this together. 7 by 50. 50 divided by 7, which equals 7.1 millimeter exit pupil. 7 by 35 is 5.0 millimeters. 10 by 50 is 5.0 millimeters exit pupil. 11 by 80 is 7.3 millimeters. And my homemade binoculars are about 29 by 130, and that exit pupil is about 4.5 millimeters. As you can see, low magnification and large aperture make for a large exit pupil. If your pupil is only open to 5 millimeters, then 7 by 5 binoculars, which produce an exit pupil of 7.1 millimeters, produces some wasted light. And 7 by 35 binoculars would provide about an equal view as 7 by 50s. If you want to use a larger aperture to gather more light, then you have to increase the magnification. So 10 by 50s with a 5 millimeter exit pupil would work well for you. So how about telescopes? How do you determine the exit pupil for a telescope? Divide the eyepiece focal length by the focal ratio of the telescope. Stay with me on this. The focal length of the eyepiece is usually stamped on the side or top, such as 32 millimeters, that's very popular, or 20 millimeters, or 12.7 millimeters. The smaller the number, the more the magnification. The focal ratio of the telescope is the focal length of the objective divided by the aperture. For any given telescope, if you change the eyepiece, then you also are changing the magnification, the field of view, and the exit pupil. In my early years, my main telescope was a 10-inch. That is a 25-centimeter reflector. That's how large the mirror was, 10 inches across. The light comes to a focus 38.3 inches from that mirror. So the focal length is 38.3 inches. The focal ratio is 38.3 divided by 10, which is 3.83. Now, as for the eyepiece, I used an eyepiece with a stated focal length of 32 millimeters. So the exit pupil was 32 millimeters divided by 3.83, which equals 8.3 millimeters. Do you see a problem here? Being a comet hunter, I wanted a wide field of view best obtained with low magnification. But that low magnification, 32 power, produced a large exit pupil. So I set about to measure my pupil, often. Mine were larger than most, about 9 to 10 millimeters in size. An eye doctor once measured it at 9 millimeters, so that is in my medical record somewhere. I have heard that people who are nearsighted, that is, they need glasses to see distant objects as I do, are, and have blue eyes and blonde hair, and my hair was blonde when I had it, they tend to have larger pupils. I read last week that people with large pupils have a higher IQ than the average person. 
That's all I'm going to say about that. I don't know if it's true. So my pupils were large enough to work with such a low-power telescope. As I got older and my pupils did not open as wide, I have had to change eyepieces to increase the magnification and decrease the exapupil size to continue to use this telescope. So why not get those eye drops that doctors use to dilate your pupils before an eye exam? One, it is a prescription medication. Second, if your pupils get too large, things can get blurry as the outer portion of your eye's lenses are not as sharp as the inner portion of your lenses. So work with what you have. With your pupils wide open, you gather more light and you can see more. But something else goes on in your eye which helps you to see better in the dark. It is a chemical called visual purple, which comes out only at night. It washes away in bright light. It is your vicious humor liquid inside your eyeball that receives this chemical, and it makes your eye more sensitive to light. Everyone says that when you go out at night, your pupils get larger and you can then see faint stars. Yes, they do. But I have always believed, but have never really heard anyone say this, that the visual purple chemical is the magic that helps you see in the dark. You saw it in your bathroom pupil measurement experiment. As soon as you turn off the light, your pupils jump open. If that's all it took to see in the dark, as soon as you step outside at night, you would instantly see thousands of stars. But you don't. It takes time for your eyes to adapt, and during that time, perhaps 15 to 30 minutes, that chemical is being formed and washing over your retina. And during that time, you can see fainter and fainter objects. One thing that I do that preserves dark adaptation is to use an eye patch, which I wear over the eye that is not looking through the telescope. If I have to turn on a small red light to check a map or take notes, I flip the eye patch over my observing eye to protect my night vision. Easy and effective. Yes, one eye can be adapted to the dark while the other is not. If you have ever looked at a bright moon through the telescope, you know that to be true. I learned from experience that these three things help you to see faint objects better. Your eyes, your skies, and your telescope in that order. For decades, I have seen amateur astronomers with aperture fever buying larger and larger telescopes so they can see fainter objects. Yeah, a larger telescope gathers more light and that helps. But also train your eye to see fainter objects and find darker skies if you want to see faint things in the sky. Now let's talk about rods and cones. You have them in your eyes. The cones see in color, and you have seven million in each eye. They are concentrated in your fovea, and when you look directly at something, such as to see a bright star or read a computer screen, you're using mainly your cones. The cones are far outnumbered by your rods. You have about 120 million rods. And they see only in black and white, gray scale, so to speak. They can see much dimmer than can the cones. You might have noticed that about an hour after sunset, the colors disappear and everything is gray scale. That is your rods taking over. Cones are used when you look at bright stars or planets. They show color, don't they? Dim stars do not appear in color. They are not bright enough to activate your cones, so only your rods see them. Two tricks will help you to see fainter objects. One is averted vision. Now normally we use direct vision. It brings the cones in line with the object and we see it clearly. But for faint objects, ignore the cones, just use the rods. Look a bit off to the side of you, what you want to see and it will brighten a bit. This is called averted vision, 
and astronomers use it all the time. They practice it, so it becomes second nature. Sometimes you might hear someone say, I was out looking at the stars, and I saw a star, but as soon as I looked at it directly, it disappeared. Well, that's why it was near the limit of visibility for the cones, and yet the rods were able to pick it up quite easily. The other thing that will help you to see fainter objects is patience. The really good top-notch amateur astronomers use this all the time. When we go out and count the stars in the square of Pegasus to determine our limiting magnitude, how long does it take you? The longer you look, the more you see. Not only will your eyes become more adapted to the dark as you stand out there looking, but your brain engages in the activity of picking out low contrast objects. It is not so much staring at the same point in the sky, but moving your gaze around as some areas of your eyes are more sensitive than others. Your brain will note those fleeting glimpses and build upon them. The same with viewing a planet through a telescope. Give it some time as the atmosphere flickers and flutters, you will have moments, tiny moments of good seeing. And during those times, your eye can pick up some details. The next thing is related to that. Two eyes are better than one. This is true, especially when looking for low contrast objects. I have heard it explained only once, and that was years ago, and I have not er heard anyone discuss it since then. But I believe this to be true. Your brain plays a big part in this. So you're looking at a field of view with both eyes. The left eye, for instance, thinks it sees something, but cannot confirm it because it's near the threshold of visibility. So it says to your right eye, I think I see something there. Do you see it? The right eye says, yeah, I think I see it too. The brain says, that's good enough for me, and paints a suspected object into your field of view. You end up seeing something that one eye alone would have not reported to the brain. No, I'm not nuts. I believe this to be true, and as a comet hunter, I've spent years studying it. Go ahead, cover one eye and look at the sky. Then look at the sky with both eyes. See any difference? Binoculars have always provided high contrast images of the sky, and I believe this is the main reason. Okay, then what about a bino viewer? That is an optical device that attaches to the draw tube of your telescope where you would normally put the eyepiece. One light path goes into it and two light paths come out of it. It splits the light in two, and you then buy two identical eyepieces, and now you can look through your telescope with two eyes. I do not own one, and I have never done the experiment to see if I could see fainter objects with one. Yes, you are now using two eyes, but you're only getting half the light from the telescope to each eye because the beam is split in two. Let's talk about the lens in our eye. When looking through the telescope, I suggest removing your glasses in most cases, then refocus the eyepiece to see sharply. You can then get closer to the eyepiece and see the whole field of view. However, if you have astigmatism because your eyeball, that is the cornea, has an irregular curve, you might want to keep your glasses on. Or you can buy a corrective lens that corrects only for the astigmatism and attach that to your eyepiece, then remove your glasses and refocus. Over time, your eye's lenses can become cloudy. This is called cataracts. Minor surgery can remove your lens and replace it with a plastic one. Quite often, this corrects for all of your refractive problems, meaning you'll not need glasses anymore. I have heard that lens replacement enhances the astronomy experience, 
except they might produce halos around bright stars. However, certain types of lenses can reduce your halos, so if you need cataract surgery, let your eye doctor know that you are an astronomer and that this is a concern. When you first look through a telescope, the lens in your eye will relax and focus at infinity. You then focus the telescope so that the image is sharp. Over time, minutes to hours, your eye's lenses will refocus slightly, so you might have to refocus your telescope several times through a night. Eye fatigue can cause you to see less. Rest your eyes before an observing session. Stay away from bright lights and computer and cell phone screens prior to observing. I always believed I saw better during my morning sessions, which occurred after a few hours of sleep. When I commuted to my observing sites, I had to contend with car headlights and street lights for the first part of the trip. But the final 20 minutes were in a more isolated area without bright lights. I would then set up my telescope by the light of my car's parking lights. Visual comet hunting can be tiring. When I'm out searching for comets, I'm peering through an eyepiece with at least an 80 degree field, continually moving the telescope so that the field is always changing. As objects move through my field of view from left to right, for example, those areas near the top and bottom of my field of view are in the field for the least amount of time. So my eye wanders all over the place looking for fuzzy objects. It took a while for me to work up to doing a couple hours of this at a time. My brain gets tired, not my eyes. I have also found that while I am comet hunting, I can hear things and listen to music and conversation, but I cannot construct a sentence to speak. Perhaps the eye uses the same part of the brain as that used for sentence construction. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Can you improve your eyesight? They say that vitamin A is good for your eyes. I used to eat a carrot a day, probably nothing wrong with that. But then I started taking vitamin A pills and that was a disaster. A person can overdose on vitamin A. And I took so much that for a while my liver was affected and I got jaundice at the same time I got mononucleosis in October 1977. So I would suggest not taking vitamin A. Bilberry is different. I take bilberry each day and I think that helps me see better in the dark. These things will improve your eyesight. Go out frequently and count the number of stars in the square of Pegasus. In time, your numbers will increase as you'll get better at it. Look for Venus in the daytime. Look for Jupiter shortly after sunset. Try to observe the very thin crescent moon near the time of new moon. With your binocular and telescope, look for fainter and fainter objects. Look for detail on the major planets. These type of exercises will train your eye and brain to see better. Turn down the light intensity and contrast on your computer and phone screens. Stop blitzing your eyes with strong light. Wear sunglasses. Next week I will discuss binoculars and how to use them to observe astronomical objects. To recap the podcast, what's up this coming week? The moon increases in brightness each night in our evening sky. Mars passes through the open star cluster M44 on Wednesday, June 23rd. See a nova in Hercules. Summer arrives this week. Do something to improve your eyesight. It is cheaper than buying a bigger telescope. You have been listening to Looking Up with Don. Episode number 76 for June 16th, 2021. I'm Don Mockholtz. Once again, the related website for this podcast is donmockholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z.com. Two H's. 
You can contact me at dontheastronomer at gmail.com. Once again, dontheastronomer at gmail.com. God willing and pod willing, I'll be back next week for another episode of Looking Up with Don. We'll talk about binoculars and how to use them to see things in the sky. All that and more. Thank you for listening. See the sky this week. I'll see you next week.